Great. Welcome, everybody. Um, my name is Barbara Cochran, and I'm the director of the Deternier Center for Healthy Aging here in the School of Nursing. And as usual, I'm also representing the Northwest Geriatric Education Center, which is sponsoring this series of geriatric health care lectures. Um, just a reminder that your SEC coordinators have information about how to register for contact hours for continuing education and that you should be filling out a profile form if you um, have not attended one of these lectures before and your site coordinators have that as well. Um, and today I'm, I'm very pleased to introduce to you Jennifer Sampson from The Hoarding Project. She's a licensed marriage and family therapist and co-founder of The Hoarding Project. Her research interests involve the influence of family and life experiences on hoarding behavior as well as developing effective and ethical approaches to mandatory hoarding cleanouts. Dr. Sampson has published multiple articles in academic journals on hoarding and completed her dissertation work on understanding the influence of unresolved trauma and loss and family dynamics on hoarding behavior. She teaches at Antioch University um, here in Seattle in the Couples and Family Therapy Department, and she currently practices therapy in her private practice and chairs the King Pierce County Hoarding Task Force. Welcome. I'm so pleased that you're going to you be sharing your expertise. Yes, thank you. So today I'm here to talk with you about hoarding disorder, um, a brand new mental health uh, diagnosis as of May of 2013. So the last two years we've taken what we used to know as compulsive hoarding um, and we've turned it into a, a standalone diagnosis. So this is something that's very important for all sorts of healthcare practitioners to be informed and aware of. Um, this is a really prevalent issue. We'll talk about definitions, prevalence rates, um, you know, etiology, all sorts of stuff, as well as um, the intersection that this mental health issue has in terms of public safety. <laughs> Um, so in terms of mandatory reporting and what we know as self-neglect, how does hoarding disorder fit in? Um, so I'm here today representing, like Barbara was talking about, the Hoarding Project, which is a nonprofit um, agency, organization that we established a few years ago to promote the effective, ethical, and sustainable <laughs> response to hoarding in our communities. Uh, we're based out of Tacoma, Washington, and we also are split between here and uh, St. Paul, Minnesota. And we're focused around providing education, treatment, and research about hoarding. Now, our work came out of some of the um, reality television shows that had uh, come to light several years ago, um, based in some of the things that we were seeing on the television shows, we decided that we were going to look into uh, this area that was clearly a mental health issue but wasn't getting really talked about it or talked about in that way at the time. Um, so we began looking at, because we noticed that uh, family dynamics were really a present and prevalent issue in at least the television shows that were on air at that time. Um, that's something that wasn't getting talked about. We decided to do some research in looking at the family, family dynamics a little bit more closely. And as through that research, we really came to see um, a big need for hoarding work, research, treatment, education. Uh, around not just the areas of families, but individuals who struggled with this behavior and professionals as well. Um, so across the board, people were needing more resources around this, again, mental health and public safety issue. Um, and that is how the Hoarding Project came to be. So I'm happy to be here talking with you guys today in order to spread the good word about hoarding disorder um, and help us to serve our clients, our patients, um, more effectively and more efficiently and ethically as well. So I think that the best place to begin, of course, is defining hoarding disorder. Um, one of the things that really makes working with hoarding really complicated is that people from different professions tend to define it in different ways um, and talk about it in different ways. So one of the things that we really need to do is get kind of an operational definition down. Um, so we're all talking about the same thing. So in terms of the diagnosis for hoarding, um, again, as of uh, May of 2013, when the DSM-5 came out, um, we're now talking about um, a, a diagnosis that has really four specific parts, not just about an excessive amount of stuff. The first part of the definition is that there is an, ex well, an excessive acquisition of things. 
Um, and when I say excessive acquisition, what I'm meaning is um, that an individual is bringing in more things, more items, more stuff than they have space for, need for, or resources for. Um, so again, above and beyond just typical consumption levels, people are bringing in things into their home. Now, not everybody who hoards excessively acquires, but most people do. So about 70% of people um, who hoard excessively acquire. Um, now, this can be done through shopping, so going to different stores and purchasing things. So compulsive purchasing may be one way of doing it. And it doesn't need to just be at you know, one specific price point. So people who hoard are not only going to, for example, like discount or thrift stores to um, purchase items. They can be shopping excessively at you know, major department stores, really expensive level items as well. So hoarding shows up across uh, socioeconomic strata. Um, but for those of you, for those 30 percent of people who are not excessively acquiring, they're what we they're doing what we call passive acquisition. Um, and passive acquisition is not going out and excessively accumulating things um, intentionally, um, or just you know ex uh, acquiring things at a standard normal level of consumption. So for example, if I needed groceries this week and I went out shopping to buy groceries for the week that I would then consume. That's just a typical level of acquisition. Um, another way of passively acquiring are things that come into our home without even trying, like mail, right? So if we're away from our home for a couple of days or a week, we'll come home to a mailbox full of you know, junk mail or bills or whatever it might be. Um, but I haven't done anything you know, in theory to go out and get any of that junk mail, but it's still coming into my home without me actively going about getting it. So again, excessive acquisition, um, most people who hoard do it, 70% of people going above and beyond um, our need, resources, or space um, and bringing things into the home. Now, of course, if things are coming into the home, feeding into the second part of the definition, um, and we're never parting with them, that things can add up pretty quickly. So the second part of the definition um, is that there's a difficulty discarding possessions. So this difficulty discarding uh, is linked in with uh, <coughs> specific reasons for saving an item. Uh, so, and this can be different for every single individual. So not, you know, everybody's, not every single person who hoards re reason for holding on to things is, is the same. Everybody is a little bit different. Um, so it's a reason for saving and also a, a feeling of distress related to parting with the object. Um, so this isn't just this feeling of overwhelm, you know, I've got a bunch of stuff sitting here and I don't really know how to start or I don't really feel like being motivated to do it. It's more than that. It's that I have a specific reason for wanting to hang on to objects um, and again, that it causes me some emotional distress about parting with them. The third part of the definition for hoarding disorder is kind of the hallmark of what we know hoarding to be. I mean, that's that living spaces can't be used for their intended purposes because of the amount of clutter um, or accumulation that's resulted as, uh, as an outcome of bringing in a lot of things and not parting with them. So this, again, that living spaces can't be used for their intended purposes. We're talking about you know, people not being able to sleep in their bedroom, bathe in their bathroom, cook in their kitchen, that kind of stuff. Uh, and then lastly, that there is some significant uh, distress or impairment to some area of functioning in a person's life that's a result of these hoarding behaviors. So when I say distress, I'm not just talking about, you know, somebody feels emotionally upset because they have so much clutter. I'm talking about levels of functioning being distressed or impaired. So day-to-day -day functioning in a home, safety levels, um, relational functioning, occupational functioning. Some level of functioning is distressed or impaired as a result of the hoarding behaviors. In terms of prevalence rates, so how many people hoard? Are some people more likely to hoard than others? Uh, we know from projections and studies, so there haven't been any big like epi epidemiological studies done about hoarding yet, so no census level data. But what we can derive from um, projections, some research projections from clinical samples, is that about two to 5% of the population hoards. So it's a, on the high end, that's about 15 million people in the United States, um, about 1 in 20 individuals you know, on the ground, on the high end of that projection. Uh, we know that older people hoard more than younger people. When I say hoard more, what I mean is with higher frequency and higher severity. I'll talk in a little bit about how um, 
hoarding typically or does show up for the first time in childhood, but we know that hoarding gets significantly worse with each decade that people age. Um, in, again, in both in frequency and severity. We know that people with lower income tend to hoard more than people with higher income. Now, I don't think that these are descriptive levels statistics, so it's not a predictive quality here. So I don't think it's really about, you know, if you make less money, you're more likely to develop hoarding behavior. I think it's more about being able to manage the symptoms in terms of um, resources, like being able to get organized or, you know, pay for storage units or things like that. Um, we know as well that uh, from research that gender differences are coming out pretty split in the research. In clinical samples, it looks more like females hoard with higher frequency and severity. In general population samples, it looks more like males hoard more. So we need more uh, research around this area of gender to really understand uh, what is going on in terms of these statistics. So hoarding in older adults is an important thing that we can, for us to consider. So like I already mentioned, symptoms, uh, the symptom severity around hoarding behavior gets significantly worse with each decade that individuals age. Um, so as we're working with geriatric populations, this is a major you know, concern. Not only are the, um, as people age anyway, we have increased risk of falls and other types of safety hazards. But the levels of uh, the outcomes of symptoms, the actual clutter that results from the hoarding symptoms, um, can complicate and increase these risks. Um, in elderly community dwelling daycare um, facility, daycare facilities, um, and nursing home residents, we have an increased level of prevalence rates for individuals who hoard. Um, we know that increased dysfunction in several domains of executive functioning show up in the geriatric population. Uh, so all of these things that, all of these uh, risk factors, these problems that can result in the general population get amplified um, or exacerbated in what we're talking about working with older adults and intersecting that with hoarding. So one of the things that's important for us to be able to determine, um, especially if we're in the role of diagnosing what hoarding is or if we're serving in some sort of um, capacity where we're doing home health care, is it's not just important for us to know what hoarding is, it's important for us to know what it is not as well. Uh, so uh, what's the difference between clutter, collecting, and hoarding? It can be kind of a fine line, uh, but we want to make sure that we are pulling it apart because sometimes our own values about what homes should look like uh, can get in the way of providing an accurate diagnosis and also engaging in a treatment plan as well. So when we're talking about clutter, just clutter in and of itself, we all know what clutter is. Clutter happens when we you know, are not picking up after ourselves. Possessions get disorganized and they can get accumulated around different living areas. But in and of itself, if we're just talking about clutter, there isn't really a major difficulty discarding the item. So not a particular reason for saving or having emotional distress about the idea of parting with it. And we're not really excessively acquiring either. Um, <clears throat> so when I think about uh, clutter, a nice visual that comes to mind are homes with small children. Um, so toys kind of scattered around, you know, needing to pick up. But uh, the clutter in and of itself is not impeding carrying on normal activities in the home. So people can still live in their, live in their living areas, you know, cook in their kitchen, that kind of stuff. Um, so if you look at the picture underneath the clutter column on the far left-hand side of the screen, you can see that while there is a lot of stuff laying around, uh, the person in the picture is still able to sit on her sofa while the flat surfaces may be covered in her, um, in her home. It wouldn't take so much effort for her to clear off the table um, in order to use it. So in and of itself, if clutter is not impeding safety, we really just kind of need to, as, as professionals, as uh, healthcare providers, need to kind of keep our mouths shut about it. Well, again, unless it's a safety issue, it really becomes a value statement, um, especially if um, those of us, not even us, like I wouldn't even qualify myself in this statement, um, people who have more, uh, who are very clean and orderly and organized, um, who tend towards that type of, you know, living environment, that's, that's all well and good. And we can, this is an area that we can start imposing values about what homes should look like, look like without actually realizing it. So we want to really keep, our, keep in check what our own values are about you know, cleanliness in the home. And again, unless it's impeding our clients or patients' safety, uh, 
and functionality in the home, people get to choose to live how they want to. So collecting um, is a very, very normal behavior. So we don't want to pathologize where we absolutely don't need to. Um, so we all know collecting. Everybody collects something. I think the last number I saw was about like 70% of all humans collect something at some point in their life. Um, so from coins to rocks to books to records, you know, whatever it is, people have lots of type of lots of types of collections. Collections are themes of new or used items. Um, they are part of a larger set, uh, and it's you know it's a hobby. It's something that people do for fun and enjoyment. If we're just pulling apart the behavior of collecting, it can look a lot like excessive acquisition. It can look a lot like a difficulty discarding items. So the center picture on this screen, so this is not my collection, but let's just say it is for the sake of this conversation. So let's call these um, you know, bottles or cans from around the world. So if this is my collection, I mean, I'm thinking about like excessive acquisition, um, you know, we could make a pretty solid argument that I do not functionally need, you know, 400 empty cans and bottles. You know, I don't have a functional use for them. I may, may even be going above my uh, resources, uh, time, need, uh, space for uh, this collection. However, um, if the display isn't impeding my active living areas at home, so in this case it looks like I've built shelves in this room to display my uh, collection, no big deal. It's not a problematic behavior if, again, this uh, these behaviors are not getting in my way of functioning in my home. However, clutter and collecting can blur into what we may know as hoarding um, once these possessions, whether they're clutter or collections, become uh, disorganized and start, again, preventing us from using the rooms for our normal activities in them. So in the picture on the far right of the screen, uh, this woman you know, has boxes filled with things. Let's say it is some sort of some sort of collection that began as you know whatever it was, uh, books, cans, whatever. Um, well, she's acquired so much of these things or has acquired so much clutter that it's actually impeding the functionality of her space. Um, now we may start, uh, we may be starting to talk about hoarding if we're also pairing that with difficulty discarding the items um, and perhaps excessive acquisition as well. So let's talk about uh, etiology. So what causes hoarding? What are some of the uh, risk factors, the things that show up um, to influence how hoarding behavior happens? So I'm a family therapist, so I think systemically. So I'm going to talk about hoarding from a biopsychosocial perspective, meaning that there's biological, psychological, and social factors that show up uh, to influence how hoarding um, happens, how hoarding behavior happens. Um, now when we're talking Talking about using systems theory to think about this, uh, we can't talk about one of these pieces without considering the other. So it's not this linear um, theory of thinking. So for example, it's not just if you have someone in your family who hoards, you're going to turn into someone who hoards yourself. It's just not that simple. Um, but what we need to be talking about or thinking about is that that may be a piece of it, but alongside of all of the other factors that show up to influence hoarding, um, we need to be able to understand, again, all of it um, in terms of understanding any piece of the behavior. Additionally, we need to understand that individuals are embedded in different contexts that influence them and also that the individual influences in return. So families, communities, cultures, environments, um, an individual living in all of these different systems is influenced by them. So for instance, we live in a culture that values acquisition. Um, and so when we talk about why people hang on to that kind of stuff, we have to think about um, the fact that purchasing things in this culture gives us meaning. And we can't separate an individual from that. Um, and we need to be able to understand some of those different ideas, discourses, um, concepts when we're thinking about how hoarding behavior shows up. So we'll talk about these different pieces in more depth right now. So <clears throat> what are some of the biological factors that contribute to hoarding? Uh, we know that there is a family history, a genetic link. We know that this is a nature and, and a nurture conversation. Uh, so there, at the genetic level, there have been uh, studies that have found that if you have a first degree relative who hoards, you're more likely to develop hoarding behaviors yourself. 
So hoarding runs in families, similar to other types of mental health issues, depression, anxiety, um, you know, bipolar disorder, those types of things. It runs in uh, it runs in families like other types of behaviors, like chemical dependency um, and other medical issues as well. Now we know that it's not only a nature conversation. We know that there's nurture too. Uh, so there's uh, studies that have found that hoarding is a socially learned behavior. So we all grow up in homes and we learn things about organization strategies, about shopping, about <laughs> discarding items, about saving items, and all of those things that we learn about in our own families growing up influence how we show up as, you know, as adults. So again, it's a nature and a nurture conversation. We know that hoarding has a, a steady course and progression throughout life as well. Um, behaviors typically, although they don't become problematic in general, excuse me, until middle life, uh, we know that behaviors show up for the first time in childhood, uh, late childhood, early adolescence. So 9, 10, 11, 12 years old are the first times that we typically see hoarding behavior show up. So it's actually really rare to see hoarding show up like midlife out of nowhere. Um, likely if we'll talk about the impact of adverse life events, the stressful or traumatic life events that might happen and exacerbate symptoms um, as people get older. But it is very, very rare that, you know, out of nowhere, somebody was very organized and didn't struggle with clutter. Um, and then as a, you know, 40-something-year-old, something happened and they just developed hoarding behavior. It just doesn't happen that way. Typically, even if it seems to have come out of nowhere, this is likely something that people have struggled with um, throughout their life. Um, so, of course, this speaks to the importance of, you know, early prevention, being able to identify this so that we aren't really struggling down the road with um, some of the safety concerns that we may be um, facing later as hoarding gets extremely severe. We know that there are brain functioning differences as well in, um, in hoarding populations, particularly in the occipital and frontal lobes. So the part Parts of the brain that are responsible for things like executive functioning, impulse control, and processing of reward value, those get looped in with hoarding behaviors, and we absolutely must be thinking about this when we're considering um, hoarding, hoarding with our clients, hoarding behavior with our clients. Um, so particularly the area of the brain, you know, the prefrontal cortex that's responsible, basically the part of the brain that's responsible for keeping a house in order, all of those functions. Um, attention, memory, decision-making, complex thinking, categorization, organization, all of those things don't function quite as well in the brains of individuals who hoard. Um, there are brain functioning differences at these different levels. We know that um, individuals who hoard tend to be more reliant on uh, memory processes, um, re over-relying on visual memory strategies as opposed to categorical memory strategies. So for instance, um, in order to remember or recall where something is, uh, individuals who hoard in one study were found to rely on the strategy, where did I see that last, as opposed to where would I have put that to remember that, so like a file cabinet or something like that, which may speak to why individuals who hoard may leave things out. Um, so we really do need to be considering this, particularly because one of the main strategies that's been used without um, much thought, I think, uh, when individuals go, in, when professionals might go into a home situation and see that somebody has, you know, some safety concerns, a directive they might be giving to a patient may be, you know, uh, you've got 10 days to clean this up, so, you know, get the stuff in order and I'll be back to check it out. But if you're giving an, a directive like that to somebody who struggles with decision making, uh, organization, categorization, complex thinking, and already has an uh, increased level of anxiety um, and level of distress about um, <clears throat> parting with items, we're really setting uh, our patients up for failure um, by, by approaching this, um, a situation like this in this way. So we really, really need to be thinking about, um, from the mental health perspective and the cognitive perspective, um, skill building around this area in order to help support um, the most effective and efficient way of working. <laughs> We know that psychological factors contribute to hoarding as well. <clears throat> uh, we'll talk in a little bit about um, mental health comorbidity. Almost always, we need to be thinking about hoarding as a co-occurring diagnosis. 
Um, up to 92% of the time, there is a co-occurring diagnosis that shows up alongside hoarding disorder. I'll have a list in a couple of slides here for you. But we absolutely need to be considering that things like depression, anxiety, PTSD, obsessive compulsive disorder, ADHD, something is likely to be showing up next next to hoarding. So it is, although it is a standalone diagnosis, it rarely shows up by itself. We know that individuals who have levels of higher levels of psychological distress also are more likely to have higher levels of or lower levels of coping skills, self-care. That gets looped in and complicates things. We know from research that we've done that individuals who hoard um, and who have gone through an adverse life event, a stressful or a traumatic life event, um, that that's actually predictive of higher levels of hoarding severity. And so all of the emotional and mental health uh, pieces absolutely need to be consider considered in how this is interacting with some of the behaviors we're seeing. At the cognitive level, the cognitions level, I should say, um, we also know that people who hoard have really specific beliefs about and attachment to these possessions. So this is a kind of a like a critical piece of the diagnosis uh, that people have these different reasons for saving the items. Um, so these reasons can be varied, and from person to person, they look different. So they're not like blanket reasons um, that every person who hoards wants to hang on to stuff. But they're linked in with things like, I have feelings toward this particular object. You know, it means something to me. Um, it's sentimental um, and linked in perhaps with memory. You know, it reminds me of a person. It reminds me of a time in my life. It reminds me of this trip that I went on this one time. Desire for control is another. Another example of a reason people might want to say, so this is mine, you can't tell me to get rid of it, um, or responsibility and waste, you know, I don't want to contribute to landfills, so I'm going to keep this and you know, recycle them and reuse them, or aesthetics, you know, this is too beautiful to part with, or, you know, this could make me some money someday. There's a million different reasons people want to hang on to it. Now, those reasons in and of themselves are bad. Those are reasons we all keep things, so let's, you know, make sure, again, we're not pathologizing where we don't need to. Where these reasons become problematic, however, is when uh, they start becoming, to use uh, cognitive behavioral language, cognitive distortion. So they get sort of uh, layered in this unhelpful way of thinking. So for instance, um, let's say I have a water bottle here and you know my mother gave it to me before she passed away 25 years ago. And this water bottle, I want to hang on to it because it reminds me of my mom. That's one thing. Um, but an example of a cognitive distortion might be, you know, if I had this water bottle and I got, thought about getting rid of it, my fear would be that I would lose all of my memories of my mother. You know, not just that these, these memories, or I would forget to think about her because I wouldn't have this water bottle, but I actually believe that if I throw this water bottle away, that my memories will also get thrown away and I will no longer have access to them. And that's an example of a cognitive distortion. We can think about that logically, and we know that memories don't lie in objects, they rely in our, they lie in our minds. Um, but individuals who hoard, if they really have strong beliefs like that, you know, if this goes away, so will my memories, of course I'm not going to get rid of it. So it, at the mental health level, we're working with clients on identifying what those distorted cognitions are, um, working on changing them um, or restructuring them with the clients. Um, so that they'll be able to think, for instance, you know, that the, my memories don't lie in this water bottle, I can then, <clears throat> because the memories are in my mind and not in this object, I can let this go with more ease. Uh, we also know that hoarding behaviors can be reinforced over time. So, you know, psychology 101 kind of stuff, uh, positive and negative reinforcement, um, doing things that make me feel good is doing and keep on keeping on engaging in those behaviors. It's an example of positive reinforcement. So let's say I'm having a bad day at work, and you know I go to this, and I'm driving home, and I decide I'm going to go shopping at like a you know a store on the way home, like Target or something. I go in, I go into the shoe section, find a good pair of shoes, and they're on sale. Um, I can you know that feeling is that gives me some good feelings here, um, and now all of a sudden I've forgotten about the other bad thing I'm feeling about. But the more I engage in those behaviors over time, like in and of itself, no big deal, but if I keep engaging in behaviors and my brain starts uh, that make me feel good to replace something that is not making me feel good, um, my brain's making the connection between uh, that 
that new behavior and a way of avoiding the bad feelings. Um, so over and over, that is how um, behaviors like shopping can get reinforced positively. On the negative side of the uh, reinforcement scale, we're talking about you know, avoiding things that make us feel bad. Um, so this is what procrastination is made out of. Um, so you know, I've got this uh, stuff over here, these decisions that I need to make about these items. Uh, thinking about it makes me stressed out to do, so I'm not going to think about it. I'm just going to walk away. Um, but the more I walk away from it, the more these items are stacking up. Um, and of course, over time, uh, this uh, if I'm bringing things in on the one hand and not getting rid of things on the other hand, um, both of these behaviors of acquisition and also discarding items or um, avoiding discarding items, um, they get reinforced, um, making it more and more difficult to manage. So in terms of social factors that contribute to hoarding, <clears throat> we know that interpersonal relationships are really, really looped in here, and, and they absolutely need to be considered. We know that individuals who have grown up in a hoarded home, um, so children who grew up in a home where their parents uh, ho had hoarding behaviors, have had some pretty strong outcomes in terms of, um, as adults, reporting things like increased levels of depression and anxiety. Uh, they were, Marriage patterns look different, they parent differently, they're less likely to have children. Um, lots of different types of long-term outcomes can result in terms of um, having grown up in a hoarded home, increased levels of feelings of isolation, that kind of stuff. Um, we know that um, it's this increased burden is something that can really fracture families. So uh, research in fam with uh, family members and hoarding that we've done we found some really uh, negative feelings that are linked in with uh, family members around hoarding. So anger, resentment, guilt, shame, you know, all of those really tough feelings that can just fracture families and make healing very difficult um, can show up as a result of hoarding. Um, this is fed by the fact that there is little education, psychoeducation, little resources out there for family members to really understand what's going on. Um, but the reason that this is so important to understand is that we also know the same study that we did that found having gone through an adverse life event um, can predict higher levels of hoarding severity. We also found that if there were positive family relationships in place, that the family could actually serve as a buffer against that increase in hoarding severity. So it's so, so important that we're focusing on um, healing family relationships if we can. Um, because, like we know, across the board, when people have more positive supports in their lives, they're going to fare better in the end, um, you know, especially in the face of stress. Hoarding is no different here. We absolutely need to be focusing on the family. We know as well um, <clears throat> that major life events and transitions can intersect with the exacerbation of symptoms. So like I mentioned earlier, hoarding isn't, is probably not going to just show up midlife for no reason. Um, it probably is something that has happened for all along. If it does show up in uh, midlife for seemingly no reason, I'm probably going to be wondering more about things like um, dementia, other types of cognitive changes, organic brain illnesses, that kind of stuff, um, influencing hoarding behavior as opposed to just a behavior that came up out of nowhere. Um, social stigma is huge as well. Uh, we know from research that stigma is a reason that people, um, so that serves as a barrier for people to seek out treatment or resources. Uh, hoarding is a particularly stigmatized area of mental health. So we really need to be thinking about particularly language around uh, the way we talk about hoarding. Um, you know, do in part to the way that hoarding is presented on, uh, in the general media, we really need to be thoughtful about how we discuss it with our patients. Um, so I encourage us as uh, healthcare providers not to use terms like hoarder, um, which can feel very pathologizing, similarly to the reason we shouldn't be referring to clients who have, for example, a schizophrenia diagnosis as schizophrenic. Um, individuals are more than their diagnosis, so uh, I encourage using language like people who hoard um, or something to that effect. Um, <clears throat> we know as well for culture that that can influence uh, behaviors too. Um, although we'll hear in research that hoarding is talked about as a cross-cultural phenomenon, 
Um, I think that we need to be considering the fact that research really has only been done, to my knowledge, uh, in uh, cultures that look a lot like ours. So cultures that value um, acquisition, that stuff gives us meaning, that we're consumer-driven cultures. So we need more research in cultures that perhaps don't value these kinds of things in order to really make big statements, like hoarding is cross-cultural. So like I mentioned earlier, um, hoarding is a co-occurring diagnosis and we need to treat it as such. Here's a list, although not comprehensive, of um, some of the different types of mental health issues that can uh, show up next to hoarding. Uh, but really, you name it, and it's been linked with hoarding in, in the literature somewhere. Um, so these li this, again, not a comprehensive list, but the, major, the most common uh, other types of diagnoses that show up next to hoarding include major depressive disorder and different types of anxiety disorders as well. Uh, in the past, hoarding has been described as a form of uh, obsessive compulsive disorder, OCD. Um, but it's, but although, but that was misleading, I think. So if we had a, a group of 100 individuals who meet, met criteria for hoarding disorder here, only about 30 or 40 of them would likely also meet criteria for obsessive compulsive disorder. So it is a separate thing from OCD. I mean, that's an important thing for us to know and realize. So safety is a major piece of consideration that we need to be thinking about when we talk about hoarding. Is it safe to go into a hoarded home? Um, probably. I mean, there may it may be safe. You know, hoarding is not always the stuff that we see on television. So this picture certainly demonstrates a, um, an example of something that may be a very big concerning safety hazard. And if it is at this level, I would recommend us not going in and contracting with a company like a biohazard company who is um, able to uh, go into a situation like this where there is squalor or filth. Um, but in general, hoarding, you know, hasn't gotten to this level. Um, but we do need to be considerate about some of the things before we enter homes, especially those of you who are focused on working in home health care. We need to be thinking about things like fire hazards, um, not just that entrances and exits may be blocked, uh, as a result of the amount of stuff at home, but of course with the increased fire load when there's a lot of items in the home, there's way more items to catch on fire. So there was one study that was done in Australia, and I think these numbers are correct, um, <clears throat> that um, in 90% uh, of homes that are not hoarded, uh, that firefighters, when they come and respond to a scene, can actually, um, they're able to maintain and uh, contain the home, uh, the fire, to the room that it began within the home. Um, however, in homes that are hoarded, I think it's 90% of the time firefighters were unable, it was a complete and total loss. Um, so there's way more flammable materials in the home and it's much more difficult to put out a fire when that happens. We know as well, of course, blocked entr entrances and exits um, are a result of uh, excessive accumulation to uh, risk of Falls and items falling is a major concern as well, especially as um, adults are aging and are becoming already more unsteady on their feet. Uh, we need to be uh, intentional about thinking that, you know, if individuals are walking just on pathways, and even if the pathways have clothes, papers, books, of course that isn't typically steady ground. If they're walking in between piles of things, um, items may run the risk of avalanching on individuals, especially in areas like of the country that we live in, like out in Washington, where earthquakes are a risk. Lack of routine home maintenance is also a concern. It's very difficult to do basic housekeeping tasks like vacuuming, dusting, um, you know, changing light bulbs. Those types of things become very difficult when there's an excess amount of um, possessions in the home. We know that structural damage to buildings can result caving in floors or ceilings as a result of excess weight. Um, and risk of eviction and homelessness is increased in this population too. Um, if an individual receives any sort of subsidy to help supplement their housing, to make housing more affordable for them, um, or if they're a renter, tenants are subject to annual inspections, sometimes more frequently, which puts them at risk uh, because of the outcomes of their mental health concern. Um, it, they are facing a higher risk of failing those inspections because they are not able to pass them. Um, due to the amount of stuff in their home. 
So this is something that really needs to be considered and really can become a fair housing issue. So one that we need to be um, some semi-fluent in understanding and language around because we may need to um, help provide some reasonable accommodation requests um, in these different situations. We know too that there's health risks associated. We've talked about some of them, but of course poor hygiene and, hygiene and grooming as well as nutrition can get affected here. If people are unable to bathe uh, in their uh, facilities for whatever reason, whether it's you know boxes are being stored in the shower or they don't have hot water because their hot water heater went out and they're not able to access it due to the amount of stuff, all of these different types of things can affect things like hygiene and grooming. Uh, nutrition as well. Um, if you know refrigerators or freezers stop working, or you know they're they're so filled with things and um, expired food is um, you know mixed in with with new food, it can become a little dicey in terms of um, managing nutrition. Uh, medical needs, finances already are complicated things for individuals to manage, especially as individuals age. Um, this becomes very complicated when, especially for, the, for things like managing prescription medications in a home that's full of clutter, it becomes very difficult for individuals to manage. Um, sleeping is a major area of concern as well. So while we regularly check in as healthcare providers about um, how clients are sleeping, we rarely ask where they're sleeping. So we really need to be thinking about this uh, and asking not just, you know, how many hours of sleep are you getting a night, but where are you getting your sleep? Um, in hoarding situations, many times, you know, they may be sleeping on, if they, even if, if they are sleeping on their bed, it, it may, their bed may be filled with stuff, so they might be only sleeping on a small portion of it. Or they may be sleeping in a recliner or on their floor, so we need to pay attention and ask about this. Um, and with, uh, you know, cleaning becoming difficult or just standard house care, we also know there are increases in things like mold, bacteria, dust, and dirt, which of course make problems like allergies, asthma, all of that much more difficult. Uh, likeliness of rodent or insect infestation uh, rises. We know that there are, are um, potential concerns, especially if facilities aren't working, that people may be using you know, containers to go to the bathroom in, so there may be human or animal, feces, urine, that kind of stuff in extreme situations, which of course presents health concerns. And the more that these symptoms kind of uh, <clears throat> work together and the more severe they get, um, the more likely we are that hoarding, these hoarding cases are go going to eventually come to public attention. So by the time hoarding uh, reaches the attention of some sort of public authority, like health department or code enforcement, or even by the time like home or healthcare professionals are in the home, um, and it is severe enough to warrant making something like a mandated report, by this time we're talking about uh, interventions or responses that may be required that are going to be intensive, lengthy, costly, and really, really complicated to navigate. Um, so in order to come up with strategic interventions that really can be effective, we need to be thinking about um, coordination and collaboration among different types of uh, professionals and agencies here. Um, but because in the past, in, in general, education and research have been lacking, the current standard responses that communities who, not, who are not informed about this are uh, responses that are ineffective, inappropriate, um, expensive, and even unethical. So let me give you an example of what this looks like. So in the past, and even currently, some of the main approaches to dealing with hoarding when they've reached really extreme levels that require community level response um, are forced cleanouts or abatement. So abatement is a, like a code enforcement word um, that means you know a situation where they go in and kind of excavate, take out all of the stuff um, in order to get a home back down to safety levels. So what this chart demonstrates is one case study a case study that an individual over 10 years filled up a house to this level. Let's see if I can do this arrow. To this level. Um, at 10 years, uh, the, the community determined that this home was uh, unsafe to live in, and so they did an abatement. They did a clean out uh, effort and brought the home, the amount of stuff into the home down to baseline. They sent the homeowner back in um, 
without mental health support, and within six months, uh, the individual filled the space back up plus some. So this is a really important demonstration uh, that shows that this is not just an individual who is, you know, stubborn, who's lazy. Um, this is a this is a trauma response to a really traumatic situation. Uh, we know that relapse rates, recidivism rates, however we want to talk about it, following a forced cleanout without mental health support are extremely traumatizing to an individual. If you've ever dealt with someone um, who's been in a situation like this, if you've ever dealt with whether personally or professionally, or if you've ever watched the reality shows, you can testify to this. Um, how stressful uh, going through a cleanout process can be for individuals without mental health support. Now, clearly. Uh, this is not a sustainable response. Within six months, it did, we, we've all of a sudden uh, come up against more damage than we already had in 10 years of building up this home to this level. Um, <clears throat> cleanouts are also very, very expensive. Um, so ranging anywhere from you know a couple thousand dollars all the way up to tens and tens of thousands of dollars on average. Um, I'm working with a company in Tacoma who uh, talks about one clean-out effort that is um, still accruing costs but is being billed to the insur homeowner's insurance company for over $150,000. Now, these are not affordable uh, types of interventions. We want to avoid them at all costs. Um, not only are they not affordable, of course, you can see from this chart, and this is not just one example. Like This is uh, just a demonstration of many different uh, case examples of how this happens. Uh, we know that um, although it isn't helpful and even can be unethical, sometimes it's necessary because uh, hoarding ha can reach points where it really, really, truly is a safety concern, and we need to figure out how to do this better. So we're trying to, f um, one of the things that we're working on is developing a process called safety days, which is uh, coordinated clean-out efforts when they're required, when they are absolutely necessary, um, done from a harm reduction approach um, to trying to manage the negative outcomes of symptoms with a layer of mental health support before, during, and after the process. And we actually are finding that these are as difficult as they still are. Um, we're having much more sustainable responses and results um, and outcomes from those, from that type of approach. Let's get this arrow out of the way. So at what point is this reportable to the authorities? This is important for us to know because this is where our legal obligation as mandated reporters comes into play. So in Washington state, uh, we're required as mandated reporters to report uh, harm or threat of harm, imminent harm, to anyone who is a, a minor or a vulnerable adult. So in this state, a vulnerable adult is defined as basically an individual who is over the age of 60 who lacks functional, physical, or mental ability to care for him or herself, uh, someone who has meets criteria for a developmental disability, someone with a legal guardian, someone living in a long-term care facility, um, or an adult living in their own or a family's home receiving services from an agency or contracted individual provider, or an adult self-directing their care per law. Uh, <clears throat> so some of the things that get called into question um, and that make this a uh, kind of a blurry gray area around what's reportable or not is this determination of, you know, is this really an imminent threat to harm? Uh, this individual's lived like this for 20 years. Does that really qualify as like an imminent threat? Uh, we know that, you know, there may be some health obstacles, structure safety issues, but I'm not really sure. So what ends up happening is that healthcare providers um, or anybody in a situation that may be a mandated reporter aren't really sure, so we tend to under-report. Um, or we make a report and protective services may come in and not quite be sure how to deal with it, and so things may not get addressed. Um, so this is an area that's really important to be considering because, again, it is really a gray area. Um, but one of the things that is reportable is this idea of self-neglect. Um, so the uh, <clears throat> the Washington State website talks about uh, self-neglect as a general term that's used to describe a vulnerable adult living in a way that puts his or her health, safety, or well-being at risk. So it's basically a person's own failure to maintain health and safety standards for themselves. 
So sudden signs may include, um, so if you know this person and you are, if they're a patient of yours and you have a long going, ongoing relationship with them, um, or you know them in your own life, signs may include a sudden decline in physical appearance, untreated injuries or health problems, or unsafe living conditions. Now, in ways that this can show up with hoarding, one term we may see is called Diogenes symptoms, or syndrome, I'm sorry. Um, and this talks about uh, hoarding situations uh, <clears throat> that are characterized by things like uh, squalor or extreme filth, um, extreme self-neglect, um, lack of shame regarding one's living conditions. So the Diogenes symptom syndrome is not um, something that's outlined in the diagnostic manual, but is, some, is a term that's been used in some of the research um, that is out there on hoarding. Um, but certainly it would fall under criteria, perhaps, of hoarding disorder. Now, likely, if we're talking about the more severe hoarding symptoms get, including when they're, we're talking about things like squalor and filth, we're talking about really, really high levels of psychiatric distress as well. Um, so in terms of comor comorbidities, we may be talking about like other types of thought disorders, psychotic disorders, you know, delusional thinking, that kind of stuff. Um, we really, really need to be involving uh, appropriate mental health referrals if we're running into this um, situation with clients. And it definitely merits a report to Adult Protective Services. So some of the challenges that we face include, you know, when do we intervene? At what point do we intervene? Like I said, the imminency of the risk for individuals is up in the air sometimes. Um, you know, we want to think about does this person or individual, if they meet some of the criteria for vulnerable adult status, you know, are we quite sure if they do or not? Um, does this individual have the mental capacity to make an informed choice about how they're living? Sometimes it's beyond our scope of practice as a, as a practitioner to make that choice or to make that uh, assessment depending on, depending on our role. So it may be beneficial to loop in something like Adult Protective Services or, you know, a mental health crisis response team who may be able to come out and do uh, an assessment to make this determination. You know, as professionals, we also want to make sure that we're balancing choice, control, independence, and well-being. Um, so as, as individuals age, of course, these are all very important things that we need to be considering, and we have to think about it as we're, as we're thinking about making reports, too. You know, individuals do have a right, their civil rights, to be able to live how they want to. Um, but when things, their health or safety is being compromised, sometimes we have to make tough decisions about intervening or not. And some adults will straight up refuse help. And we can offer interventions, uh, like Adult Protection Services, for example, can offer interventions um, and may be able to help, but a person needs to be willing to accept it in order for us to, to make any movement. So some of the things that we need to be able to do uh, to, to help uh, in these different situations are to, help, again, stay alert to any small changes that we we, uh, that might indicate a problem with someone who may be aging. You know, are things like newspapers or mail piling up? So this is talking about like a significant event that may have occurred uh, to see if, um, if there was something that is influencing a sudden or drastic change in behavior for this individual. So the self-neglect may not be this like long-standing continuous pattern of behavior, but something that may have come up, you know, in the relatively recent past. Um, a significant negative change in this behavior that's concerning. Uh, we want to be alert to pay attention to these different signs. Um, if we become concerned and for whatever reason we're at, uh, like on the property, we want to knock on the door um, and we want to try to make an, to intervene. There are too many stories I've heard about individuals who have kind of known something's going on but not really been sure about how to intervene and or if they or if they should, and um, you know some bad things can happen as a result. In Minnesota, we've heard too many stories about professionals who kind of knew, family members who kind of knew, didn't do anything to intervene, and, you know, a fire started, fire responders got to the home, and an individual had, they were not able to get into the home because it was too full, they couldn't get in, um, and the individual passed away. So if you see something, say something. You know, everything is reportable, 
Um, it's whether or not uh, the protective services uh, will make the determination about investigating a particular case or not. Um, so looping APS in, I think it's really important for us to understand what adult protective services actually does. Um, this is, uh, there are a lot of myths about APS's uh, kind of jurisdiction in terms of intervening. We need to know that Adult Protective Services is a voluntary investigative agency. So what this means, unlike CPS that can sort of, Child Protective Services that can really has a lot more authority to do interventions, APS is voluntary. So if a, an adult kind of refuses their services at the, you know, they'll knock on their door, um, an adult refuses their services, um, APS will do everything possible, but if they are, um, if the individual isn't willing or is not wanting to engage with APS, there it really is little that they can do. Um, so APS cannot uh, remove a person from their home against his or her will or force them to get help. They can suggest that, and if, uh, you know, if they get the individual's consent, they can absolutely help um, work on connecting with resources, but they are typically an underfunded agency. They can't themselves go in and do things like uh, fund a clean out. There just simply isn't resources. But they can help connect, again, individuals with community resources that can help towards that end. But again, they, APS in and of themselves um, are not able to do a lot of things that we think they can do. <clears throat> um, APS, the only times that APS can intervene without the consent of a, of a vulnerable adult is if all other avenues have been exhausted in terms of helping this individual, if this person has been found to be incompetent of making uh, decisions for themselves by the court, um, and a court order has been granted to appoint a legal guardian to make decisions on his or her own behalf. So there are, you know, the way if APS intervenes um, without consent, this has been kind of probably a long-standing problem, and they've gone through guardianship. So this is, I mean, very, very important for us to know, because sometimes we call Adult Protective Services to help them, um, and then are frustrated when, you know, they're not giving us the outcome that we're hoping for, but they may have done everything they can um, in order to, you know, to help us with what we're needing. So in terms of balancing these um, pieces of mental health and public safety, uh, care providers, as care providers, we really need to balance protecting individuals' rights and autonomy um, while effectively responding to public health and safety. So this is a, like a delicate balance of the two. Uh, we know that through Mental and uh, thorough mental, mental and he physical health assessments. Um, we need to be able to determine where clients are at, and we need to be focus focusing as well on uh, the mental capacity of the individuals we're working with. Uh, we want to be able to develop positive and trusting relationships with our patients, um, especially in hoarding situations. Especially um, hoarding is something that oftentimes has kind of flown under the radar and has been really kind of secret behavior for many, many years. You know, I hear a lot from different practitioners about, you know, I've worked with this client or patient for years and years and years, and all of a sudden I just found out that they hoard, like that hoarding is a problem for them. Like, I'm not sure how this even happened. How did this happen? Like, I should know this. I'm their therapist. And I say, you know, you probably never asked, or they were probably just really good at kind of hiding that behavior. So we really need to lean heavily on uh, building that positive and trusting relationship in order to make any movement. We want to be able to provide mental health treatment for co-occurring diagnoses, even if treatment doesn't improve hoarding. Like I said, a hoarding is a co-occurring disorder, and we need to be treating it as such. So things like depression and anxiety can complicate um, treatment for hoarding uh, disorder. So sometimes, you know, if we deal with things like being able to manage intense anxiety or being able to manage depressive symptoms, um, some of the hoarding behaviors may be able to improve, um, even just by focusing on some of those extended um, but related diagnoses. Uh, we also re want to reduce risk by emphasizing increasing safety rather than eliminating hoarding behavior. So this is sort of what harm reduction is all about. We'll talk about harm reduction in just a second. Um, but sometimes, especially in older adults, we actually know that 
working on changing thinking patterns and all of that other type of developing like big levels of insight around hoarding may not be the most effective or efficient use of our time um, in terms of mental health treatment, but we may be able to work with them in terms of harm reduction. So minimizing the risk that's a result of hoarding um, to focus on safety rather than completely eliminating the behavior itself. And we also want to work uh, collaboratively with the appropriate community agencies in order to pr improve communication and develop coordinated responses, especially when hoarding becomes uh, very severe. So <clears throat> uh, it's very, very important for everybody to be really well informed of different types of agencies that may support um, coming up with a good response to hoarding. Um, because again, the more severe hoarding cases get, the more complicated they are to manage. And we need to be able to work collaboratively um, to know how to speak with different types of professions um, across fields in order to uh, coordinate these different responses. So the chart on the bottom of the page I think is a really good one in terms of you know, types or the goals of interventions that can be geared towards different types of individuals. So if we determine that um, you know, in, uh, high risk, so in high risk in terms of safety um, is met with high capacity, so the individual has you know, high mental capacity in order to make their own decisions, we're really kind of left at uh, you know, a standpoint to accept the client's right to self-determination. They get to make their decisions about how they get to live. We can offer strategies for helping, um, but if they don't want to engage in that, that's you know, beyond our control. If safety is a concern, but clients have low capacity, we may intervene and um, even work up to pot potentially um, including legal guardian or conservatorship um, as an avenue for, for helping preserve client safety around this area. And in the middle ground, like high risk, moderate capacity, um, we want to, in order to reduce resistance, we want to be leaning heavily on uh, that positive, trusting relationship and focus on things like harm reduction. So reducing risk um, and working on, uh, with them on ways of increasing their own mental capacity and physical capacity as well, perhaps through things like linking in with other types of services, including mental health. So I've just been talking about harm reduction. Here's another slide to talk about it. Um, but gen in general, um, Dr. Michael Tompkins out of San Francisco uh, talks about harm reduction for hoarding uh, situations. And really it's a, this idea that it's a set of practical strategies to reduce the negative consequences of a particular health issue. <clears throat> so the goal isn't to eliminate hoarding behaviors here, but to minimize the consequences that might come out of it. So fire hazards, you know, increased risk of falling, um, you know, inability to use showers, that kind of stuff. We want to target those different areas of um, potential uh, harm, uh, and we want to uh, not just address them, but then figure out ways to prevent them. That again, it's not addressing the behavior in and of itself, but working with individuals in order to maintain safety, so coming up with plans around that. And this can be really helpful for individuals, especially if there are things like Cognitive, impair cognitive impairments, um, or for people who are just really unwilling to um, develop insight or seek out treatment. So some examples of harm reduction goals um, may be again around safety, health, or comfort. Um, so thinking about specifically, if we're going into uh, homes, uh, we can look and be very targeted around, you know, these are specific safety areas. Uh, so like three foot pathways to and from all entrances. We want to be able to make sure that in the event of an emergency, for example, a gurney would be able to get in and out of the home without much problem. Uh, clearing walkways, moving flammable materials away from heat sources. So not storing papers on top of the stove, things like that. Health, we want to make sure facilities are being able to be used, um, that we have an appropriate process for disposing of trash and waste. Um, that individuals are helping, professionals are helping um, people come up with plans to manage this. And comfort as well, you know, that if there's heating and cooling problems in moderate climates like ours, um, heating and cooling is less of a major issue than places like, you know, Alaska might be if, if you know, heating wasn't working. That could be a major, major problem there. Um, <clears throat> making sure that places to sleep and eat 
um, are clear and designated and making space also to conduct daily tasks. So harm reduction goals can be set around any of these items and it could fall within our capacity as, um, as providers to be able to help work towards these goals. Again, these are great types of ways, uh, avenues in um, for clients who are pretty resistant to wanting to work with you know, mental health services, for example. If we can focus on you know, objective pieces around health and safety, we may be able to have an avenue in. Engaging in things like motivational interviewing strategies, so tapping into what clients' um, own motivations for change are, may be really great uh, way to introduce things like harm reduction targets. So some local resources, or local or national resources, of course the Hoarding Project, the hoardingproject.org is a website that you can go to and can serve as sort of a hub for um, connecting with other types of resources. We help with things like education, of course, like this, um, connecting with consultation, other types of um, agencies, organizations, uh, locally or nationally. Uh, the International OCD Foundation is the main foundation in nationally that most of the hoarding research comes through. Um, they have an upcoming conference in Boston in just a couple of months. Uh, the Mental Health Association of San Francisco also does a really excellent hoarding conference once a year. That's in the fall um, in San Francisco. So if you're interested in learning more about hoarding and cluttering, I really recommend going to this conference. The Institute for Challenging Disorganization is a professional organization for professional organizers. Uh, they offer a lot of different teleclasses on their, uh, on their site. They have developed one assessment tool that I find particularly helpful in terms of um, <clears throat> assessing hoarding and it talks about, it's called the clutter hoarding scale and it talks about hoarding on different levels, so like levels one through five in terms of severity. So there's a nice handy assessment tool that's available on their website. Um, and there's plenty of support groups as well. So locally within the Seattle area, we have uh, support groups that meet. We know that there's online resources too. So connecting with groups like Children of Hoarders, Clutterers Anonymous, um, you know, those types of groups are available for like online so people can connect with people virtually in order to receive the help that they're wanting or needing. Task forces may be a wonderful way really especially to address hoarding in severe community situations. We have a local one here, a, co a couple of them around this area um, and there's over 80 of them around the country. So if there, I would really recommend looking into your areas to determine to see if, you know, if there is a task force that's set up, this is a wonderful way to link in with a local resources beyond just your own, you know, perhaps medical profession, with mental health, law enforcement, code enforcement, housing, cleaning companies, uh, you know, health department, you name it. Hoarding is a type of mental health issue that reaches across fields. So we really, really need to be focused on um, finding the best resources and task forces are a great way to do that. Here's a list of other types of reading resources. I would recommend these not just for clinicians or uh, providers, but also for um, you know, clients or family members who are struggling with hoarding. Um, but beyond that, I wanted to leave some time for questions here. Um, so, Barbara, do we have questions that have come in as we've been talking? Uh, not yet. Yeah. So bipolar disorder, uh, I don't know if you mentioned that specifically in the comorbidities. It seems that you know, if I get, go out and you're going to be kind of, kind of manic kind of sure. to go out and, and, and get stuff and then you know, the depressive part is going to lead to that yeah. isolation. Mm -hmm. How do you want me to? Just repeat the question. Okay. Yeah. So the question was um, bipolar disorder in terms of kind of the, the manic phases and the depressive phases, because that can certainly affect how, you know, hoarding behavior shows up, right? Um, and that can make things, especially unmanaged bipolar disorder, can make uh, treatment for hoarding disorder really, really complicated. Because during the, you know, the, the phases of mania, 
um, certainly like compulsive shopping can be a big, big piece of that. And then when we're working towards creating change, if we're if clients are falling into that depressive cycle, uh, you know, tough, remaining motivated to continue to make changes, it's it really, really is complicated. There was a, a period of time where I had you know, several clients who were struggling with that um, as a comorbidity. So perhaps wasn't listed, but mood disorders, including bipolar disorder, um, absolutely can show up next to it and absolutely can complicate treatment. And I think in the manic aspect too, um, paranoia. I mean, paranoia in the manic, manic aspect. aspect. I, I need to, you know, sure. Bring these yeah, yeah, definitely. So again, super, super important that we are making really um, <clears throat> educated uh, diagnoses, um, making sure that uh, the mental health practitioner who's uh, working with individuals who, you know, with hoarding behaviors, um, it, or that we're appropriately um, applying those types of diagnoses. Yeah. So Cheyenne is um, wondering if folks who have excessive number of animals, if that's a hoarding disorder. Yeah. So animal hoarding is uh, is a thing, <laughs> um, and can be a really complicated thing as well. Um, so right now. There is not a separate criteria, like a separate diagnosis for animal hoarding in the diagnostic manual. So if you found yourself in a situation where somebody was accumulating animals and a lot of them, uh, we could, if we needed to diagnose it and kind of put it somewhere, it would meet criteria for a hoarding disorder. Um, there's enough in common with it that it could. So rather than, you know, the the number of possessions that prevent us from using our living spaces for their intended purposes, we're talking about animals now here too. So animal hoarding isn't just like a quantifiable number. So it's not like if you have more than six cats, you you know you're someone who hoards. Um, but it really is about provide being able to provide basic minimum care for a number of for the animals that one has. Um, now with animal hoarding, <clears throat> and especially when it becomes really problematic, it can uh, you know unlike things like you know books, um, animals of course reproduce. And that can really, really, things can get out of hand very, very quickly. Now, sometimes with animals, you know, it begins with really well-intended behaviors, like rescuing a couple of animals, but soon it can really, you know, become very overwhelming, perhaps because of reproduction or because people have taken in too many than they can manage. Um, now, sometimes it's just someone who's overwhelmed with caregiving, you know, that that's, doesn't necessarily mean that it is, you know, criteria for animal hoarding. Um, but it that's again why we need to loop in like a mental health professional to do an assessment to determine if it is someone that's really gotten overwhelmed and or if it is again uh, looping in with that reasons for saving you know I want to save these animals I'm the only person that can do it um, whether some of that like kind of distorted thinking is in place around it but yeah animal hoarding is a, is a thing and it's um, high high levels of comorbidity high levels of psychiatric distress really more severe diagnoses we see alongside of it. A relapse rate is incredibly high. Without mental health support, recidivism rate following like an animal seizure, like when animal control comes in and takes animals away, 100% recidivism rate. We absolutely need to be involving mental health alongside of it. So Tim uh, says that one client states that the hoarding began when she managed to control her addiction to alcohol and became sober. Is there research on the link with addiction issues? Um, <clears throat> so I'm not as fluent in the research in terms of links with addiction. I know that it does, uh, and it can. And it's certainly like other types of process addictions, like uh, chemical dependency or gambling, you know, shopping, things like that. It's not uncommon for someone to quit one type of addictive behavior and like kind of leech on to another. Um, so. If it's like an excessive acquisition thing, that's what I might be kind of focusing on, you know, if it's a compulsive purchasing thing. Uh, so probably not speaking directly to the question in terms of like prevalence rates and what I've seen, um, but it can. I think the behaviors, what I know about, you know, addiction, behaviors can transfer when one person quits from one. So it's more with working about an individual at the mental health level their individual to manage distress so as not to just re redirect that behavior in a different area. And Cheyenne is asking if um, we're seeing an increase in numbers with online shopping being available. 
Are there an increase in numbers of online shopping? You know, I don't know in terms of like trajectory in that way. Um, certainly, I think over the last several years, as hoarding has come to the public's eye more due to like its presence in the popular media, um, that we're seeing an increase in numbers that way. But hoarding has been something that's been around forever. It just We just haven't had language to talk about it prior to recent years. Um, certainly, online shopping makes hoarding or shop, like acquisition more easy and accessible. Um, so even if individuals are not you know, mobile, like they don't have their own transportation or things like that, things can easily come into home. So it makes it more difficult in terms of uh, working and making sure we're targeting uh, the acquisition in mental health treatment. Um, how do residential programs or long-term facilities deal with hoarding situations effectively addressing other residents? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, <clears throat> I mean, every situation is so different. You know, I've worked with some facilities, like assisted living facilities, depending on what's going on. Um, like perhaps if like a person has some cognitive cognitive impairment or something like that that prevents you know mental health, like working on insight and developing other strategies around new behaviors, on developing harm reduction plans around that. So dementia. You know, helping individuals who have like a hoarding tendencies that are linked in with dementia, um, which would make mental health treatment not an effective way or strategy of approaching it. You know, working with the nursing staff on going in to develop plans for making sure that, you know, safety is maintained and that kind of stuff. Um, but certainly any sort of residential care facility or um, even rental property, property management, whatever, um, people need to live within the constraints of their lease agreements, their rental agreements, you know, whatever it is. And if those types of agreements are in place, we get, like, that's actually to our benefit in terms of protecting people's safety. So a lot of uh, property managers, for example, that I talk with, I don't like to do inspections, so they kind of just, like, skip them or avoid them. But if hoarding's in place, skipping inspections can be, like, a a really critical mistake that people can be making. Um, I even recommend if we flagged hoarding as a potential issue to increase inspections to keep you know, the bulk at a minimum um, because it, hoarding is not something that will get better on its own. So harm reduction in really tough situation is the best way to go in about it. Um, but you know, focusing on safety I think is where we, where we need to land. Yeah. Um, so Kodiak is saying if an elder is taken from the hoarding environment due to the, some unrelated illness, what symptoms might be manifested if they're, for example, put into an extended hospitalization or a SNF stay or something like that? Um, I'm not sure I'm following the question. In other words, so they are, are hoarding at home, yeah. but then they get, for some unrelated issue, they need to go into the hospital for something. Sure. What might people look in the hospital or what should people be concerned about as far as signs that yeah. problems might be Hoarding's a tougher one, right? Because we're link talking about excessive acquisition and people's possessions. So when we're away from it, it's tougher to like see. It's not like we're assessing for anxiety and depression where we're watching for flat affect and or like, you know, tenseness or whatever. Like Light of ideas. We're not like looking at for that kind of stuff. Hoarding is tougher to assess when we're out of the home environment. So I think it's so important because what happens then is individuals who get put taken out of their home for medical treatment or whatever. I get tons of calls from like medical caseworkers who are saying my client has concerns about going home now. Like how do we manage this? Um, it's so important for you know healthcare professionals in situations like that to be asking about the home environment, you know, to potentially, if they're not going into it, at least asking questions about, you know, ADLs, activities of daily living, or, you know, functionality at home. Um, using types of assessments, there's tools called, <coughs> like, excuse me, <coughs> the clutter hoarding scale or the hoarding or the clutter image rating scale, which has actual pictures that people can refer to. That's through the, um, the IOCDF, International OCD Foundation. But doing assessments to talk about the home environment is so important um, at the front end because it's not going to be observable behavior that we'll see. Yeah. 
Um, so there's a comment here, and I'm just wondering if you wanted to add anything to it. Um, she says, this is my first conference on hoarding. I've been into several patients' homes, and I could not understand the need for all the stuff. I would report to my supervisor and recommend a housekeeper to help with the cleanup. Now I understand. I'm so grateful for your information. Good. I'm glad. But would you have anything more to add? Because we do have this situation where home care workers would go into a, a home and their job is to sort of help yeah. with housekeeping and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. and how should they approach this issue? Yeah, that's a, a great question because by just dealing, like we've been talking, right, by just dealing with the symptoms, like clean out, we're just in a way kind of enabling the behavior. If we're not really working to create sustainable changes, um, working to just like help tidy up over and over, we're not, it's not a sustainable response unless we've found like uh, funds to pay for ongoing chore services until like the end of time, right? So if the goal is to actually create behavioral change, mental health isn't like a, it's a must. It's a mandatory piece of wanting to do this work. If it's a situation where harm reduction, so just managing and maintaining a safe environment is what we need to do, then it may be, um, you know, a relevant and appropriate choice to involve, uh, you know, perhaps chore services or something like that. But I wouldn't recommend like, health professionals to go in to do that. That's beyond our scope of practice to do that. But looping in resources to support that could be if harm reduction is the goal. And I'm not sure what's going on, but um, I heard from someone that they couldn't hear what I was saying. So would you mind just oh. repeating my question a little bit? Yeah, what was the question again? It was about people who go into the home and see the what's sure. going on. So home health care um, and for individuals who go into to the home and uh, see that hoarding is going on. So in the past, perhaps have been helping with some, you know, light housekeeping or whatever. Um, I would say that if that's part of a harm reduction plan in order to just maintain safety over time without the goal of behavioral change, it could be appropriate. But if you're hoping to actually make behavioral change, if hoarding disorder is what's if that's what's going on, cleaning up with or for somebody isn't going to make any lasting sustainable change. Thanks. Yeah. Sure what's going on. Well, no problem. Any other questions?